started Black Atlantic about a year and a half ago. Uh, it was about a week before Black History Month and under duress. So uh, yeah, we really scrambled. We put together this whole brand in about eight or nine days. And of course it's evolved and grown over time. But uh, yeah, we, we started with the, you know, with the, the social media channels and the podcasting software and the setup and the hello, logos hello. and a, a plan and our website, we built a website in, in eight or nine days. Yeah. One of the biggest ways we feel we break down stereotypes is through exposure. <laughs> exposure <laughs> therapy for Atlantic Canada. You know, it's no secret that uh, Atlantic Canada, specifically New Brunswick, has always been a homogenous culture. Now we know there's Anglophone and Francophone, but uh, people with you know a, kind of a more traditional European skin type who, uh, without having other cultures here, have never had exposure to black people other than maybe what they see on cops on TV at night or some of the worst rap music. You know, it does tend to portray us in a more negative light a lot of the time. So what we've been able to do is, you know, we interview doctors, lawyers, artists, musicians, teachers, high school students, and just through the people that watch our show, uh, they get a real sense that we are humans, we are people, we are not just uh, a black stereotype. We have diverse feelings and opinions, possibly even political views. Uh, and I think that's part of why we're here. So I want you to talk more about the gap that Black Atlantic fits between also the audiences that are not black, what they learn, and those who are from the black audience of what they see in role models when you're looking at the doctors and all that. A lot of our listenership are white allies and or white people hoping to be allies. And I think a lot of what we do while we want to amplify the black community is educate white people about the realities of what it's like to be black because we recognize that they are the people, the majority in this province that are the, pe the policy makers, the people who are going to invest in us. And we want them to care about what we're doing so that there is that snowball effect because it does very much feel like we are building black community but without the white community, how far can we get on our own? Impact, we've helped build the Black Histories curriculum that will hopefully be taking effect soon. It is my proudest thing that I've ever done, going to school and never learning really about black people outside of these typical American black people, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, um, and only learning more recently about Viola Desmond. It felt to me like such a shame that there wasn't more being done. I've literally had teachers put me in Zoom calls with black kids that are in Riverview, adopted by white parents who don't know black adults. And that impact to me is huge, that there are just kids who I, like individuals that I am changing their lives versus sometimes, you know, the, the macro versus the micro level. Um, and again, hearing, you know, people who've been on our podcast come back and say how much their life has changed. Fair and Family Farms is a very big one, but as well, the only black drag queen in the province, Norman Hector, who goes by Normani, uh, we featured him as well. And I wrote an article um, for, for By Blacks, an organization, um, online magazine out in Ontario and connected him to a drag queen that I was friends with who was on The Amazing Race. And he said to me, he had never met another black drag queen and been able to commiserate over what it was like to be black, queer, older, and in the arts. He talked about what it was like to be a black gay person in like the 60s and the 70s and trying to grow up in, in the St. John area. Um, and the, those are the things that matter. Again, we don't want to trauma mine, but there is something in commiserating around how hard it's been and knowing that these people are either on their way out of that feeling or that we've been able to bring people together that is so paramount for me in this work. Right now, we're at the Music New Brunswick Awards Week, having a great time. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on what they've been able to set up for emerging and established musicians. I remember Music New Brunswick when I was a student at UDM, and I remember feeling that it was not maybe as relevant. And being here now, I've not only recognized so many people that I went to school with during that time period who were emerging then and are finally getting their accolades, but hearing the rich history of musicians in St. Andrews, outside of Bathurst, people who've moved from Nova Scotia who now call New Brunswick home, it's been very inspiring and empowering. I appreciate the effort that they're putting in to have more diversity. We'd love to see even more of that. Um, it's been, you know, a big pleasure talking on the conferences about things that 
relate and are intersected into the music culture, but are maybe not music proper. I do not have the musician accolades that my business partner does, but it's been nice to talk about things like sound recording, podcasting, and sort of bring those industries together. So I'm, I'm a proud New Brunswicker, proud of what Music New Brunswick has done, and I just hope to continue to see it thrive. So like when I research these artists, there's some artists that have thousands and thousands of followers and monthly streams and, and histories and other artists that have 55 Spotify followers. Uh, and you know, Music New Brunswick has really brought them into a high quality environment, putting them on a stage with industry movers, uh, high quality sound uh, where we've really been able to enjoy and see, uh, see so many great artists that even I've discovered this week shine that I'm now following and uh, looking to connect with. I know you're both a team. You both bring something unique. And I know in your background that you've been to New York Fashion Week. You are something of a fashion idol. I wonder what that beauty aesthetic has helped you bring to this business organization. Oh gosh, you say that, but I think that actually I leave so much of the aesthetic and branding to Clinton. Um, I, that's, it's really funny that you asked that way. I mean, I don't know in terms of beauty. I think that maybe what it's brought is I've really tried to champion, not to say that you haven't, but I think that our niche interests definitely contribute to who we want to talk to. Mm -hmm. I think at the beginning when we were really curating the list of people, unless people were just asking to be on the show and, you know, excited about what we were doing, there was definitely a laundry list of, you know, United Colors of Fashion and what they were doing for fashion in the black community out east and, and looking at, um, you know, Atlantic Fashion Week and I chased my interest and tried to bridge the two because I felt like as an interviewer, if I was passionate about who I was talking to, um, it would translate and be such a better episode. Lo and behold, I'm just passionate and I like what all black people do. So it never had to be about the fashion. Um, I would say that maybe I try to sometimes dress nice if I'm not too tired on a show, but really our, our, like our orange vibe and the logo, the teasers, all of that stuff, that's all this guy, like sound, aesthetic it's it's really it's really all you one thing that Hillary didn't mention is her background in comms and communications her university education in communications so that has really helped with uh, her ability to outreach uh, and secure opportunities she's really good at uh, pitches and selling and stuff like that whereas myself uh, with the background of being a lifelong entrepreneur um, and business owner you know mm -hmm. I, I have that experience with graphic design, uh, website building and development and, and maintenance as well as audio engineering. Uh, I'd say we're both pretty techy uh, in terms yeah. of like gear and setup and figuring stuff out like that. So what are some things that could really boost if you could ask for one thing that would just allow you to amplify more stories and more voices? Money. Money? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we could pay it on I the saw, I, I, Another half second and I would have been right there with you. Our goal in all of this is to have content creators and, and people on the ground in all of the provinces and pay those people to know what's going on in those communities because I cannot be in Halifax, he cannot be in Halifax. We don't have a full scope of what's going on with the black community in Newfoundland. And it would be so nice to have all of those things logged and documented. We've had so many messages from people in New Brunswick about just how hearing us talk or hearing us interview guests living alone and so isolated made them feel connected to something, mm -hmm. made them feel like they weren't so alone, that their voice mattered. Uh, a lot of our guests have shared similar stories. We've been doing this for almost two years mm -hmm. and uh, the thing that would really help us is, yeah, you know, just- Dollars kind of and people. Investment, dollars and bodies. Dollars yeah. and bodies.